Welcome to the Institute for China America Studies. My name is Alec Chance, and today I'm joined by Dr. Michael Swain of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Michael, welcome. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. You've described the current order in the Western Pacific as one of American predominance. What exactly does this mean, and how did the United States end up in this position? Well, American predominance is a term that some people take exception to. Um, they think it sounds too kind of um, controlling, uh, that the United States controls everything in the Western Pacific, and that's not what the term is intended to mean, in my view. What it means is that the United States has historically, since the end of the Second World War, so now 70 years or so, enjoyed a position in maritime Asia second to none in its military capabilities and to a great extent in its economic capabilities. Um, it has been able to operate its navy from bases in the Western Pacific, South Korea, Japan primarily, others down in Southeast Asia, in ways that really brook no kind of major challenge. So it had an ability to prevail, to win decisively in any kind of altercation that might occur along the Asian littoral. Uh, so it essentially means uh, the ability to have freedom of action and the ability to prevail unquestionably right up to a nation's 12 nautical mile limit. In your view, what are some of the reasons that many Americans are committed to maintaining predominance in the Western Pacific? I think most Americans, um, again, most Americans wouldn't think of it in those terms, but most uh, policy people in particular believe that the American position of unassailability, if you will, in the Western Pacific has served to create peace and stability in the region. It has suppressed historical rivalries in the region through America's relations with its allies and its forward presence militarily. And it has generally acted, as the term goes, as a kind of honest broker in uh, interacting with other states in the region, both allies and non-allies, in ways that <clears throat> is designed to uh, deter or dissuade others from resorting in the use of force and other ways that could upset stability in the region, and therefore has allowed the region to focus on economic growth and development and not on historical and other rivalries. So the notion is having a single dominant, largely benign power as the U.S. regards itself in the Western Pacific really serves as a kind of a stabilizer for everyone and benefits everybody. At least that's been the argument. You've argued that this status quo is unacceptable to China and unsustainable for the United States. Why is this? Well, primarily because of changes in the power relationships and in the interests of the two countries and other countries in the region. I mean, China has now developed a range of interests off its own shore that are economic in nature, political, military, and it's developing the capability to be able to support and advance and protect those interests in a more effective way than in the past. And it's developed a greater sense of vulnerability to possible threat to its most important strategic equities, which are its cities along its coastline, its economic areas, which again are concentrated along its coast, and its activities overseas. So in the past, China didn't have the incentives nor the capability to really think about defending its interests uh, beyond its own shores. So China has had to adopt a much more forward-leaning, more offshore, it's called active defense, strategic posture that will allow it to actually deflect threats to its environment before they actually reach China's shores. So that has really changed the way the Chinese look about their defense in many ways. There's a fundamental shift in relative power occurring in Asia. And that is in the form of the growing economic and military capabilities and presence of the People's Republic of China, the dynamic growth of a group of other Asian powers um, that are now um, developing their own capabilities that go beyond just simply ones designed to maintain domestic order and stability, but have some offshore capabilities. And the United States itself is and has encountered a range of different 
domestic political, financial, economic, etc. problems that are to some degree constraining its own capabilities and, uh, and its, its ability and willingness to devote large amounts, increasing amounts of resources in a major way uh, to various areas around the globe. In my view, this changing power dynamic in the Western Pacific is not going to produce a Chinese position of predominance in the Western Pacific. It's just not going to guarantee that the U.S. will remain predominant. So there will be an uncertain power environment within the region where the United States might think it's still predominant or wish it to be still predominant, but in fact it's losing that position. And the Chinese believe that they can achieve greater levels of power and influence, possibly to a level of predominance, although I don't think the Chinese are currently directly after that kind of objective. But in any event, the two sides could increasingly miscalculate the implications of this shifting power relationship, either by not, by not recognizing it or by misunderstanding it in various ways. So you have the increased likelihood that you could get uh, crises in the region as one side or the other reacts or overreacts to a changing power dynamic. So what steps do you think should be taken in order to establish a stable balance of power in the Western Pacific? To, es to establish stability in this, I think the two sides have to establish a stable balance of power. In other words, they have to stabilize that balance of power that is in fact emerging in the region. And they can only do this by undertaking certain types of changes. The first change, beyond recognizing the situation, is I think they have to embark on a range of far more extensive confidence building measures and crisis management mechanisms that will allow the two sides to avoid misunderstanding and miscalculations in a variety of potentially dangerous situations running from the Korean Peninsula down through Taiwan and into the South China Sea and Southeast Asia and perhaps even beyond. So they need to do that. A second thing is I think they need to transition their force levels. They have to transition away from a more offensive oriented war winning strategy to a more defensive oriented denial type of force posture that is not as um, escalatory and does not rely so much on preemptive rapid action in a crisis. It's important for both sides to transition away to this mutual denial force posture. And then finally, I think it's important that the countries look seriously at those major sources of contention between them and demilitarize and to the extent possible neutralize these issues as sources of future strategic rivalry. Your recommendations apply specifically to the strategic balance in the Western Pacific. How would these adjustments affect the overall U.S.-China relationship? Well, I think this adjustment would have enormous implications for the overall relationship. The United States and China, the only area where the United States and China could actually come to conflict today or in the foreseeable future is in the Western Pacific. It's, it's the primary basis driving strategic suspicion and strategic competition between the two countries. If you can basically remove that as an issue and establish a greater level of stability in the Western Pacific, I think you could then open up doors to much greater levels of trust and understanding in dealing with a wide range of issues, um, whether it be um, the Middle East, uh, relations toward Russia, um, economic relations globally, um, the use of um, U.S. and Chinese forces uh, in dealing with non-traditional security threats that go beyond the Western Pacific. Um, a whole range of different things could become more, I think, the stronger basis for cooperation, less of a basis for mutual suspicion. How does the South China Sea issue relate to the broader shifts in regional power that you've been discussing here? Well, the South China Sea issue uh, really is relevant at different levels. Um, initially, it was, it was really about the peaceful resolution of disputes between several powers, China among them, and, its, and its several of its Asian neighbors in dealing with these over, overriding um, or overlapping claims, 
both in the East China Sea and in the South China Sea. And then the issue slowly became more rooted in the longer term capabilities of the states involved because they have greater capacity to actually go out and affect these issues, to go out and patrol around these islands, to send greater and greater levels of fishing fleets around to these areas. They became more important uh, in the public mind among all of the publics of these states. And the Chinese began to pay greater attention to these issues as an important area of its own, of their own national interest. And they did so in part in response to what they saw happening among other powers who were becoming themselves more active, more assertive. Now, in that context, the United States then became involved in this, both in the East China Sea and in the South China Sea, and staked out a much clearer and I would say a more deeply involved position in, in dealing with the South China Sea issue. So it has now evolved to the point where it is being seen by many as a kind of a test, a test of American credibility in its ability to preserve what it regards as the proper recognition of rule of law and peaceful resolution of disputes. And on the Chinese side, it's been seen as a kind of a indicator of the strength of the Chinese state in defending its nationalist aspirations. So it's taken on a much larger level of strategic interaction between the U.S. and China. And what it's done in the context of this shifting power balance between the two countries is it's become the primary example of the dangers that I pointed to earlier, which is the Chinese have greater capacity in the South China Sea, and they're more inclined, therefore, to use that capacity and could miscalculate and overuse it. And many people are saying that that's exactly what they're doing today. And the United States, on its part, feels it has a greater commitment to show others that it is not declining in a relative sense. It still has the capacity to deter the Chinese from being too assertive. And so the United States has the danger of overreacting, of asserting too heavy a military imprint in that area. And therefore, the two sides could ratchet up the situation and you could get an escalating crisis. Do you think that the United States can ensure its interests in the South China Sea in a way that's acceptable to China? Yes, I do. I mean, I, I think the U.S. really only has two fundamental interests in the South China Sea. One of them is a general recognition of the rule of law in adjudicating and resolving these kinds of disputes, these maritime disputes, and it has a strong interest in uh, freedom of navigation, keeping this area open to transit by commercial ships and to some extent by military ships as well. And of course, part of all this is a peaceful resolution of any kind of conflict. It has those two fundamental interests in mind. I think China and the United States can reach understandings on all those issues. The Chinese are not looking to use force to seize the South China Sea, despite the remarks of some pundits. They know that the situation there does not permit them either in terms of their capabilities or in terms of global reaction, not just within the region, to just use overt military force and start seizing the islands and throwing people off, which would involve inevitably loss of life. So the Chinese have to think that they can position themselves in a way that doesn't sacrifice their position, that builds up their leverage to some degree, but doesn't necessarily lead to them controlling the whole area. In other words, at some point, they're going to have to compromise to some degree, and other sides are going to have to compromise as well to, at the very least, establish a stable modus vivendi until there's a final resolution. So there needs to be a path towards demilitarization, clarification of claims, identification of areas of joint development that can go forward, and on this basis all, the establishment of a code of conduct for the states involved. I think in this process, the United States can act as a distant player here that doesn't get too heavily involved, that is willing to tailor its activities in the South China Sea, restrain them in different ways, 
in response to Chinese restraint and not just go right in and increase its position uh, under the assumption that the Chinese will not restrain themselves and need to be deterred. There needs to be a dialogue with the Chinese on these issues with some understandings reached, and I think that's very possible. Let me ask about the issue of mutual misunderstanding. In what ways do people in China fail to understand American perspectives? I think many Chinese really misunderstand how the United States sees its role in the world and how it measures and employs its various means, political, diplomatic, economic, to protect its interests. Um, I think the Chinese people too often tend to assume that the United States has a very sophisticated, clearly thought through, long-term strategy for maintaining its power virtually at all costs, and in the process suppressing, containing China's emergence as a major power, both regionally and globally. I think that that notion that many, many Chinese have is really a distortion of how the United States looks at its power. Yes, the United States believes that its predominant position in Asia serves the interests of all countries in the region. It also has a somewhat similar view to its unique position globally. But that doesn't mean that the United States and U.S. leaders, as a result, uniformly must and exert all efforts to contain and hold down the Chinese people or other states that are trying to develop. I think that there needs to be a greater degree of understanding that, you, that Americans are willing to compromise. They're willing to accommodate in significant ways if they believe that the other side shows a real willingness to do the same in some meaningful ways in some really meaningful ways, and that it doesn't resort to sort of unfair practices in a variety of ways. And I think, I think Chinese need to recognize and give the United States some flexibility or at least some leeway in understanding that the United States is not so resistant to China's rise as many Chinese think. And on the other side of the coin, in what ways do Americans fail to understand Chinese perspectives? I think many Americans need to understand as well uh, several things about China. Um, the first and foremost is probably the fact that the Chinese state and Chinese society have undergone and continue to undergo enormous change uh, in their daily lives, in their outlooks, in their standard of living, in their capabilities. Uh, in their sense of uh, both security and insecurity, China is in many ways going through still a big process of change. And that change is requiring a lot of discussion, a lot of turmoil, a lot of debate within China. As with the United States, China does not have a clearly thought through long-term strategy for achieving a particular major goal, let's say dominance of the Western Pacific or replacing the United States as a global power. I don't see the Chinese government and Chinese leaders believing that they can establish that kind of an objective in any kind of foreseeable time frame, or that that kind of objective would necessarily serve Chinese interests. I think there's much more contingency in the way the Chinese think about their environment. Now, at the same time, I think a lot of Americans have to understand that as China moves forward, it labors under a heavy burden of its past. And a lot of that burden revolves around its image, whether it's false or not, of how it was treated in the 19th and 20th centuries. Many Chinese have a sense of for lack of a better word, a sense of resentment about how they've been treated in the past. A once proud nation that was brought low and mistreated for many, many years. I think the Chinese 
at some point need to get beyond this feeling. They have to be able to establish what I would regard a more forward-looking nationalism that doesn't rely on this kind of feeling. But I think some sensitivity to this feeling is important for Americans and for Westerners to understand that it really does influence the way Chinese look at other countries and in some ways therefore requires greater dialogue in order to, in some instances, disabuse Chinese of their suspicions about the West and other countries. Finally, if you were to give advice to a young person studying U.S.-China relations, what would you tell them to focus on? Well, I'm biased. I'm somebody who studies national security issues. So, and I've seen many young people come through the Junior Fellows Program at Carnegie, uh, just out of college, from the top schools in the country, who have come to work for me, uh, primarily, in my work, and have gone on to go into PhD programs and other programs to do work on Asian security and U.S.-China security issues. I think there is a great need for more analysts in this area, and it's very difficult for many students to do this because it doesn't fit neatly within a particular academic discipline. It doesn't fit neatly within political science. It doesn't fit neatly within history or international relations study. It's, it's something that sort of falls between the cracks, but it's an important thing to do, and it needs to be done fairly broadly. In other words, people have to think about security issues, not just in the here and now, but medium to long term, and they have to think more about what is national security, what is strategy, and how is it changing over time? How can I help to better understand the changes that are going on in Asia and the world in ways that can improve the security of the countries involved. If students had more of a focus on that and went off to study that, um, I think there'd be a lot more interesting uh, thoughts coming out and a lot more interesting uh, ways of addressing some of the problems that I've been talking about. Well, Michael, thanks very much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Thank you, Alec.